So the, the uh, topic in particular that I want to talk to you about today is the role of video cams in the Black Lives Matter movement and in the public really becoming much more aware of this serious, horrible problem of police killing innocent people, African Americans, sometimes uh, totally innocent, certainly uh, in the many cases that we now know about it, innocent of any major crime. Eric Garner, who was uh, choked to death in New York a few years ago, his crime was selling cigarettes individually. In New York City, it's against the law. You can't buy a pack of cigarettes and then sell the cigarettes individually. You might ask, why is that against the law in the first place? I don't know. I think it's a stupid law, but that aside, the price that Mr. Garner paid for this quote, crime, unquote, was capital punishment. He was killed. So he was innocent of any crime that could possibly have that kind of punishment uh, accorded to him. And not to mention the fact that he was never tried in a court of law and never found guilty by a jury of his peers and, and so forth. So that's the problem that uh, we're looking at and that I'm going to be talking about uh, now. And as with the story of media and politics throughout history, and as is the case with just about any research topic, including your research topics that uh, you look into, you can go really far back in history. It's just a question again of how far back in history you want to go. So if we're talking about video cameras and their role in stemming and stopping police murders of innocent black people, you can go back to why Africans were brought here in the first place as slaves. And you could go back to a little more recently than that uh, in the 1830s, the end of the 1830s. That's when photography was invented. That's when the first still photographs were taken. And then you could go into motion pictures were invented in the 1880s by Thomas Edison here in the United States, by the Lumiere brothers in France, by a man by the name of John Freeze Green in England. Or you could go into the uh, 20th century and the invention of video. But what probably is the most significant technology or technological development in this today growing worldwide movement to finally do something about these murders committed by people who are supposed to protect the people and instead kill some of the people. Probably the most significant technological development was not just the invention of video, but the invention of portable video cameras. And we talked yesterday about anecdotal evidence. And I can give you some anecdotal evidence of my own about portable video cameras. I remember when I was a student, an undergraduate student at New York University uh, in the early and mid 1970s, everybody was very excited and I was too. I was majoring then in communications, won't come as a surprise to you, that's what I was always interested in. And it was then uh, in, you know, like 1974, 1975, that something called a porta pack, P-O-R-T-A-P-A-C-K, porta pack became available. And it was actually a pretty heavy thing, even though it was portable. It was something that you strapped on your back, but, and somebody had to actually not only strap it on your back, but 
make sure everything was turned on in the right way. And it had like a microphone and a video camera. And you could walk around and do videos of people. And uh, as a student at New York University, you know, it's right across the street from Washington Square Park. Many uh, was the day that I and other students in the class would go out and interview people in Washington Square Park. So this is uh, at the early to mid 1970s, the, the dawn of portable video. And it was that technology which again, uh, you know, this magical device that all of us carry around with us, this portable telephone, that's what it started as, but now has also become a portable video camera, a video camera that weighs almost nothing and that we can use to take uh, pictures, videos, anytime we want on an instant notice. And it, it was videos of George Floyd that uh, got this whole worldwide outrage started just a little over a month ago. And if there were no videos, well, most people who have looked into this unfortunately have uh, found, historians have found that police have been doing this you know, ever since there have been police. And here, let me just offer another bit of anecdotal uh, testimony. That is testimony from my own life experience. A testimony that I think, however, is relevant to this uh, topic, very relevant. Uh, once upon a time, and uh, I can tell you roughly when it was, it was the late 1950s. I was just a kid. And um, believe it or not, it was pretty much right around this time of year. I remember it was uh, uh, just a couple of days before July 4th. And the reason why I remember that was I was standing with my friends in front of a Carvel. I don't know how many of you have heard of Carvel ice cream. I think there were one or two Carvels that are still around somewhere. It's like a soft serve ice cream. It's probably terrible for you, but it tastes great. So we were standing around a Carvel ice cream uh, located, uh, a little ice cream shop located on Allerton Avenue and Boston Post Road, if you're familiar with that part of the Bronx, uh, enjoying ourselves, talking and, you know, having a good time. And a police car pulls up and two guys get out of the police car, two cops, and they announce in big, loud voices, we're searching people for firecrackers. You're not allowed to have firecrackers, even though it's July 4th. And within a minute or two, a cop comes up to me and says, hey, you have any firecrackers on you? And I say, no. And he says, I, I don't like the way you answered me. You know, I was the same sarcastic person that I am now. So I didn't just say no, like in a respectful way. I said, no, you know, like that. And uh, he said, well, I want you to empty your pockets. And then, you know, being the same person I am now, I said, do you have a search warrant? So that really got him angry. He threw me up against the wall and he searched uh, my pockets, didn't find any firecrackers. You know, I was so furious about that. When I went home, I told my father, he got angry too. We went down to a police station. We filed a complaint, nothing happened. Obviously, uh, the officer denied that he did anything like that. Anyway, not that that was so terrible, but it certainly wasn't fun, you know, being pushed up against a wall by a police officer. But I came to realize it's a good thing that I wasn't African-American. You know, if I was an African-American kid who opened a mouth to a police officer who was illegally searching me for firecrackers, he had no reason to believe that I had any firecrackers. Uh, I could have been killed or certainly beaten up. Who knows? So as it is, because I was white, I was just pushed up against the wall. But because of that, I've always had a special eye out uh, and focus on these things that police officers do. So 
1991, that is an extremely important year in terms of Black Lives Matter and police being brought to account. In 1991, there was a man by the name of Rodney King, and he lived in California. And I can't recall exactly what it was. He committed some kind of crime and the police were trying to arrest him. Their way of arresting him was after uh, chasing him for a while, they nearly beat him to death. The crime that he was accused of committing or committed, by the way, was not in any way a capital offense or a serious crime. Uh, he was uh, brought to a hospital where fortunately he did recover. He did pass away in 2012. Uh, most people, the doctors say that uh, it was not due to the injuries that the police gave him in 1991. He recovered completely from those. But it certainly didn't do his life any good to be beaten so badly. But what made the beating of Rodney King so important in this Black Lives Matter movement is that it just so happened and very fortunately for justice somebody in an apartment overlooking where the los angeles cops were beating rodney king nearly to death somebody in 1991 had a video camera now by 1991 it was almost 20 years since the porta packs had become available uh, in uh, New York University and around the world that I mentioned earlier. By 1991, the video camera had evolved. It was not yet in telephones, but it was much, much smaller. It wasn't a heavy thing that you had to struggle with and carry on your back. And I remember my family and I, uh, uh, we would go up to Cape Cod every year. Right around that time in 1991, I, I was too cheap to buy a video camera, but I rented a video camera in a store for, I don't know, 25, 30 bucks uh, for a day or two. And it was great. I still have the videotapes that I took of our kids and our family at the beach. So they were easy to use. They were widely available. And this was the first time that what the police were doing in this case to a black man, was caught on camera. Now, everyone got really upset about this because it's one thing to hear about something. It's one thing to read about something. It's quite a different thing to see it with your own eyes. Now, later on in the term, when we talk about fake news, we're going to talk about deep fakes. And it's not as if videos should be believed 100% all the time because videos can be edited, they can be cleverly faked to show certain things that didn't actually happen, but not back in 1991. There were video editing capabilities, but they were nothing like the kind that we have today. The reason being in 1991, Digital editing was very, very new. There was some digital editing, but most of the editing in 1991 was still done just by splicing the video. So nobody doubted that the video showed something that actually happened. And I remember very clearly back in 1991, there was a lot of almost relief among uh, the African-American population here in the United States and among all Americans and everyone around the world who thought this was a horrible thing that had been happening over and over again, police killing innocent black people. There was a lot of relief that now finally we have this on video. You know, the cops can lie all they want about what happened. They can say, 
all they want, the, the usual thing that, hey, you know, uh, we didn't do anything wrong. We were provoked. Our lives were threatened. We thought our lives were in danger. We thought there were other people in the public whose lives were in danger. You know, the usual stuff that police say. But that video of Rodney King being beaten so badly, it was crystal clear no one's life was at stake except Rodney King's. He was in no way a threat to the police once they had him in custody. The same exact thing with Eric Garner, the same exact thing with George Floyd, the same exact thing with all the black men and sometimes women as well who have been killed by police. The video made it crystal clear that the police were themselves the criminals in that situation. So what happened to the police? Well, the relief that people felt very quickly turned to something else. It turned to anger. There was anger to begin with, but uh, the anger got even worse when it turned out that uh, at first, nothing at all was done to those police. Eventually, they were brought up on trial. They were found not guilty in those trials. So you might ask, how could a jury find somebody not guilty for beating someone when that beating is right there in black and white in this case on a, uh, a video recording? Well, the answer is people can make whatever decisions they want. And this is an important point and it has implications not only for Black Lives Matter and our judicial process, but democracy in general. Most historians think, and I certainly agree, that democracy in the political process, that people being tried by a supposedly objective jury who decides whether the person who's accused is guilty or innocent, most people think that, hey, that's a, a better way of proceeding than having some dictator decide what the country is going to do or having some judge decide whether a person is guilty or innocent. But it's not a perfect solution because the people on the jury are human beings and they have prejudices and they sometimes can deny what they see with their own eyes. I'll give you another anecdotal example of that. We all know about DNA evidence, which has become the way that criminals are identified. Well, DNA first became important as a way of I identifying criminals back in the, again, early 1990s. And I knew a guy who was a police captain out on Long Island. And actually, I didn't know him. I knew his daughter. My wife and I were friends with his daughter uh, and her husband. And, you know, we used to talk about these things because her father was a police captain. And to make a long story short, she told us that her father, a police captain, didn't care about DNA. He didn't think DNA evidence was really scientifically valid. He wasn't a scientist. He was just a police captain who chose not to believe DNA evidence. Now, the jury is, was free, of course, to choose not to believe their eyes when they saw the video. This is the weakness of our jury system. And the only way that this can be improved is by educating the public 
enough that they're willing to put aside their preconceptions. In this case, that the officer is always right. You know, when the jurors who acquitted the cops who savagely assaulted Rodney King, when they were questioned afterwards, why did you do that? Why did you acquit them? Their answers were almost always along the lines of, well, you know, the video couldn't possibly have shown everything. I have confidence in these police officers. Why would they do something like that? And even though a reporter would say, well, I mean, but so you are agreeing that that's what the video shows. The jurors would say, well, yeah, you know, but it's just from one angle, maybe from another angle, it would show that the cops weren't doing what the video shows. Those were the kinds of answers that they gave. Because here is a, a concept that applies not only to Black Lives Matter, but applies to fake news and all kinds of things in our social media age. And there are actually several words for it. Today, one of the most common phrases is news bubble. And I'm sure some of you have heard the expression that we, we each of us live in a news bubble, meaning we, we don't let into our awareness news that contradicts what we already believe. And this concept explains why I said earlier uh, informally that today, July 2nd, 2020, in President Trump's brief address to the country in which he was talking about the reduction in unemployment, which is a good thing, he lied about something else. He said, we're really doing great combating the coronavirus. And although the number of deaths has declined, we're not at all doing great because the number of people being admitted to hospitals with COVID-19 has skyrocketed across uh, many states of, of the country. But Trump supporters don't believe that Trump is lying. They think that he's telling the truth. And if I were to say to a Trump supporter what I just said to you, hey, if you look at the state of California, if you look at the state of Florida, if you look at the state of Texas, you see an increase, a huge skyrocketing increase in the number of people who are suffering from the virus so badly that they're being admitted to hospitals. They would say to me that somehow I got my facts wrong. And if I were to say to them, well, hey, Dr. Fauci, Tony Fauci was making this point just yesterday or the day before on television. Do you think he has his facts wrong? He's a world-renowned expert in this area. They would probably say, yeah. They would say either Fauci got his facts wrong or I, Paul Levinson, didn't hear him correctly. That's what it means when you're in a news bubble. And I, I should say that all political views and people with all political views suffer from this to some extent. So I usually watch MSNBC. And when uh, I get tired of MSNBC, I'll watch CNN. Pretty much the only time I ever watch Fox News is when I'm a guest on a program on Fox News, which happens maybe once every 10 years. And even then, my wife isn't happy that we're watching Fox News, and I don't like Fox News either. So I'm a professor, I study this, but I live in a news bubble as well. And just to give a little more historical context about these news bubbles, there was a Harvard professor back in the uh, 1950s and 1960s, and he did some work a little after. His name was Leon Festinger, F-E-S-T-I-N-G-E-R. And he had a theory 
he called it a theory of cognitive dissonance. And his theory, and if you think about it, it makes sense, was essentially what I was just talking to you about regarding news bubbles. His theory was people avoid information that causes them cognitive dissonance, meaning it disagrees with what they already believe. And this happens not only in politics, it happens in interpersonal relationships. You know, if you are very good friends with somebody and then you hear that that person did something that you don't like, the first reaction of most people is to think, no, well, maybe that report is wrong. You, you stand up for your friend because you, you are trying to avoid the cognitive dissonance of you, you have this good opinion of your friend, but somebody saying your friend did something that you don't like. So it's hard to reconcile those two things. And most of the time we shut those things out. So we tend to be in love with the ideas and the preconceptions that we already have. I'll, I'll give you just one more media theorist. And this time again, it's Marshall McLuhan. In his 1964 book, Understanding Media, he talks about the Greek myth of narcissist. Narcissist is the uh, beautiful, handsome young man who was so handsome that he just loved looking at himself. And the, in the myth, he uh, goes to a little pond and there's a beautiful nymph in the pond who calls to him. Uh, and he pretty much ignores her, even though she's beautiful, because he's more interested in looking at his own reflection in that pond. That's what he loves most. So most people are not as far gone as narcissists, but most people, and this was McLuhan's point, enjoy watching things that support what they already love and believe. And we tend to avoid things that contradict that. So the problem with videos and Black Lives Matter and bringing cops to justice is how do you get juries to divest themselves of these news bubbles, divest themselves of this faith that they have in the police, a faith that is so strong that they will disbelieve what their own eyes are telling them. And here, let me draw a distinction. People who have actually had negative experiences with police, they have no trouble believing what those videos are showing. And that's why I mentioned to you what happened with me uh, in front of that Carvel ice cream place all those years ago. One of the reasons I have no trouble believing those videos is because I had an experience which while nowhere nearly as bad at all, I mean, it's nothing compared to what's been happening to black people over and over again, but I saw that ugly side of the police in firsthand experience. And that is the one thing that can break through those news bubbles. But now moving ahead, sadly, the videotaping of Rodney King's beating did not change a thing. I mean, let me just jump way ahead to just the last week or two. The police are very entrenched in their ways. Even after George Floyd was killed by a knee to his neck that suffocated him, even after chokeholds were banned, and they had been banned already in many places, but people like Andrew Cuomo announced in his daily briefings about the coronavirus, which he expanded to include the Black Lives Matter movement and his response to it. 
he made it clear that here in New York State, chokeholds are illegal. Police are not allowed to use chokeholds. And they should be illegal because they're too deadly. They don't just subdue a suspect. They can pretty quickly kill a suspect. So the problem is the police, even with every single thing that has happened in the past month and weeks, with all that, they're still using chokeholds. I guess it was about a week or a little longer ago here in New York City. Again, some police were caught on camera using a chokehold. Fortunately, they didn't kill the person. And I think they were, you know, suspended. This is another one of the problems. Uh, it, 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 if I murdered somebody, I'm a professor at Fordham. If I murdered somebody, it's no joke. I really shouldn't be laughing, but it, but it, it, it is sort of ironic. Uh, and, you know, it, it's hard not to be cynical about it. If I murdered somebody, I would not only be fired as a professor, I'd be arrested and tried for murder, right? That's what happens when you murder somebody. But when a cop murders somebody, somehow a lot of the people in our society think the, the just punishment for that is you should be suspended and maybe fired. That's the way it's been for the most part. So the really burning question is what happened in the George Floyd murder that made that different? And let me just say here, we don't have time today. I could go over, I could talk to you for hours and hours. And I, there is a, a video of a talk I gave at the, the University of Pennsylvania at, in the Annenberg School in Philadelphia a couple of years ago. It's on the syllabus. You can check that out. I mean, there's just murder after murder. Sometimes it's little kids. In one case, some poor little boy was carrying a toy pistol someone called up saying they're not sure what it is the police came by to investigate that poor little kid wound up shot to death by police sometimes it's police breaking into the home uh, of an african-american family and 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 killing someone there and, and guess what it turns out they broke into the wrong home so this has been happening over and over and over again what made the George Floyd video so different? And it is different because it has resulted in this, not just nationwide, but worldwide outpouring of protests, of people saying we can't put up with this any longer. It wasn't just that this was caught on video. Because again, the Eric Garner murder, not by a knee, but by a nightstick to his neck in New York a few years earlier, uh, and in his case for the horrible crime of selling single cigarettes from a pack of cigarettes, uh, that didn't result in anything happening to the police for years. And eventually, their punishment they were fired about five years later. They're not serving a minute in any jail for the homicide that they committed. So there was video of that. People were very upset about that. What made the George Floyd video different? And here we get, I think, into one of the most interesting and important parts of any research. And obviously, I don't expect you in your research to go out and do this level of research, but I do want to encourage you to think about these problems and these issues. The beginning of research is you describe the history of what happened, and then you talk about the current situation, and you find sources that you can use to help explain and expand 
what you are looking into. So I mentioned Leon Fessinger, I mentioned Marshall McLuhan. But at the conclusion of all good research, the researcher tries to explain what she or he has found in the research. And the fancy name for explanations like this that scientists use and I'm sure you've all heard it, is you come up with an hypothesis with a suggested or a suggestion or a suggested explanation of why this happened. And that has the advantage of putting out there for future investigators something they may want to look into further. So at this point, it's still too soon to have any conclusive answers as to why the George Floyd murder resulted in this incredible resurgence of the Black Lives Matter movement. And it's way too soon to see what ultimate impact that is going to have. But it's not too soon to speculate as to why this happened now. So here is my explanation. It's a hypothesis. It's not a fact. And you can think about it and see whether or not you agree with it and whether or not, uh, you know, maybe there's a better explanation or maybe I left something out. But what was going on in the world? What was in the news every day, all the time, when George Floyd was murdered in Minneapolis? Well, it was COVID-19. Many people in the United States had been pent up in their homes uh, for weeks and weeks and weeks. People were frightened. People were frustrated. People had an enormous amount of energy. And people were upset about the COVID virus because it was something that they had no control over. In fact, to this day, we barely have control over COVID, right? We don't really fully understand it. We don't know why it seems older people are affected worse than younger people, but sometimes younger people do get it very badly. We don't know why there are some people who are symptomless but they can go around and infect other people. Lots of things that we don't know about COVID. And we're going to be talking about COVID and the media later on in the term. But one of the things that we do know about ourselves regarding COVID is that just about all of us feel helpless up against COVID because there's not that much we can do about it. We can stay at home, we can wear masks, we can decide not to frequent restaurants and eat indoors if they're open. But those are really rather unsatisfying ways of combating this virus. Everybody hopes that eventually with any luck, maybe by the end of this year or early next year, there'll be a vaccine. Maybe they'll have developed ways of treating people who have COVID so they don't get so sick. So that's what scientists are feverishly working on. But those don't exist now. So most people understandably feel especially powerless now. We always feel powerless to some extent. There are always lots of things that are beyond our control. But one of the things that the COVID-19 pandemic has done is it's heightened our sense of helplessness. So I think the reason that the murder of George Floyd in Minneapolis had this effect, it was almost like a, igniting this explosive movement that had been simmering under the surface, is that it happened. That video was seen by people who were already very, very upset. And here is another reason why I think that's the case. Throughout our recent history, beginning with 
the Rodney King beating being caught on video. Although there have been some white people who have been very upset by this and have joined in Black Lives Matter, Black Lives Matter had a much greater level of support in the African-American community here in the United States than it did in the white community in the United States. But if you think about COVID-19, it actually does affect African-Americans a little worse than uh, white Americans, uh, partially because their economic conditions are in many cases not as good, so they don't eat as well. Uh, but even though that's the case, there's also no doubt that just about every human being is a potential victim of COVID. And so everyone was a victim and still is a victim of this pandemic. And the killing, the utterly unnecessary, wanton killing of this innocent man in Minneapolis, everyone who was already a victim of the virus, I think could feel what it meant to be a victim of the police. And tragically, the virus kills people, and tragically, the police kill people as well. So it's still way too early to tell what the result of all these protests are. Uh, what has already happened, you know, these things evolve very quickly, is that the Black Lives Matter movement has expanded from just, hey, we have to do something about police. It's expanded from that to, uh, rising up and speaking out against racial prejudice uh, in general in the United States. And you know, if you follow the news, I'm sure you know about some of this, the taking down of statues like Robert E. Lee's statue. I uh, saw another uh, press conference uh, a couple of days ago. This was Joe Biden uh, talking uh, about this particular issue. And by the way, Joe Biden, who will likely be, who will definitely be the Democratic candidate uh, for president in the next election, he has a very different position uh, on the police than Donald Trump has. But on the issue of taking down uh, statues, Biden drew a distinction between Robert E. Lee and say George Washington. Now George Washington did own slaves, but George Washington wasn't a traitor to the United States. Robert E. Lee may have been a great general. He may have been a gentleman. It's true that he ended the war when he saw it was hopeless. He surrendered to Ulysses Grant uh, and, and in that surrender, ended the slaughtering that was going on in the Civil War. But he was a traitor to the United States, right? He, he uh, was basically fighting for a group of states that had left the United States and w were basically trying to impose their views of what was right and wrong on their people in their states, including keeping slaves. And that's what the Civil War was about. So I think that this reckoning of bringing down statues uh, of people who were basically traitors to the United States, not heroes uh, to the United States, who basically fought against the United States of America, even though in their own view and in their own culture they were regarded as noble, I think is a good thing. But I think it's also important to uh, keep in mind that that is not exactly the same thing as bringing police to account. And I'll conclude uh, this little lecture by saying what I hope does happen is that finally, almost 20 years after the video recording of Rodney King being beaten and after murder 
after murder and murder and murder of innocent black people by police, by guns, by knees, by nightsticks. After all of those years of these things, in many cases, being caught on video, I hope that what results of this, from this is uh, finally a reconfiguring of police. You've heard about defunding police. Obviously, we need police because there are criminals, but we don't need police who themselves become criminals. And the result of the George Floyd video might well be, and I certainly hope it is, that at last the video has had the effect that all those people uh, in 1991 and ever since then have hoped that it did happen and will happen.